Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live. And go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I commanded you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that, that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land where ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb. When the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. And ye came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire unto the midst of heaven, with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire, Ye heard the voice of words, but saw no similitude. Only ye heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments, that ye might do them in the land where ye go over to possess it. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves. For ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb, out of the midst of the fire, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image of the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, as ye are this day. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes, and swear that I should not go over Jordan, and that I should not go in unto that good land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. But I must die in this land. I must not go over Jordan, but ye shall go over and possess that good land. Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord God, your, of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and made with which he made with you, and, and make you a graven image, or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. When thou shalt beget children and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves, and make a graven image, or the likeness of anything, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God, to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day, that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land, whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it. Ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. 
and the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. And there ye shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shalt be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swear unto them. For ask now in the days that are past, which were before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from the one side of heaven unto the other, whether there hath been any such thing as this great thing, or hath been heard like it. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as thou hast heard and live? Or hath God essayed to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation, by temptations, by signs, and by wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God. There is none else beside him. Out of heaven he made thee to hear his voice, that he might instruct thee. And upon earth he showed thee his great fire, and thou heardest his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved thy fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them, and brought thee out in his sight with his mighty power out of Egypt, to drive out nations from before thee greater and mightier than thou art, to bring thee in, to give thee their land for an inheritance as it is this day. Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart, that the Lord, he is God in heaven above, and upon the earth beneath there is none else. Thou shalt keep therefore his statutes, and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee, and with thy children after thee, and that thou mightest prolong thy days upon the earth which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. Then Moses severed three cities on this side Jordan toward the sun rising, that the slayer might flee thither, which should kill his neighbor unawares, and hated him not in time past, that fleeing unto one of these cities he might live, namely Bezer in the wilderness in the plain country of the Reubenites, and Ramoth and Gilead of the Gadites, and Golan and Bashan of the Manassites. And this is the law which Moses set before the children of Israel. These are his testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which Moses spake unto the children of Israel after they came forth out of Egypt. On this side Jordan in the valley over against Beth Peor, in the land of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt at Heshbon, whom Moses and the children of Israel smote after they were come forth out of Egypt. And they possessed his land in the land of Og, king of Bashan, two kings of the Amorites, which were on this side Jordan toward the sun rising. From Aurora, which is by the bank of the river Arnon, even unto Mount Sion, which is Hermon. And all the plain on this side Jordan eastward, even unto sea of the Sea of the Plain, under the springs of Pisgah. So we can go back to the beginning, verse 1 of Deuteronomy chapter 4. I'm just going to walk through this verse by verse. I'm taking the title of the message, I have taught, ye should do. I have taught, ye should do. And that comes from verse 5, obviously, where he says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land where ye go to possess it. So I have taught, ye should do. This was the call of Moses as he distributed unto the people. And, and greater than that still is that God is teaching you, and ye should do these things. So we ought to take heed to these things for that very reason. Verse 1, it says this, Now therefore, hearken. Now what does hearken mean? It just means listen. It's not just hearing, and it's not just an audible sound, and I've said this before, but in hearkening is actually is actually an absorbing or a retaining or or a 
catch this, you know, hearken unto this thing. Something is being said, and it's not just a wonk, 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 wonk noise that's coming through. Rather, it's something that you need to listen to, pay attention to, and absorb and retain what's being said. So Moses begins and he says, Now therefore, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live, and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. So he's saying, I'm about to teach you some judgments. I'm about to give you something, and it's so important that if you retain this, if you absorb this, if you catch what I'm about to say, you may live as a result of it. Life comes from what's about to be taught here. We need to be teachable. I heard this saying when I was a baby Christian, right? I heard this saying, be teachable, and also, furthermore, that every man is my teacher. Every man is your teacher. This came from a preacher of mine. And I thought to myself, why would every man be your teacher? We should go to God for these things. We should look to the Lord for statutes and judgments and teachings of any sort. But as I've grown, I've learned what he meant by this. As a baby, I thought, that's stupid. Doesn't the Bible say that the anointing which ye have received of him, ye need not that any man teach you, and that same spirit, paraphrasing, will teach you of all things and bring them to your remembrance? So why would I need some man to teach me? Why would I need some man to guide me when I could just have simply uh, the Word of God teaching me? This statement, every man is your teacher, that's bizarre. Go to God, right? Not so, though. We don't need necessarily men to teach us, but it's good to have, and I've learned that as the years have gone by. There are positives and there are negatives that you can behold whenever you look at any man's character or any man's walk, and that's what I've come to understand is that you learn from others, it's not always what they're saying, it's not always what they're doing, it's not always what they're saying per se, but more what they're doing. Sometimes you can learn from example of others. You can learn from other men and how they behave and react to certain situations. But ultimately, yes, look to the Lord, but hey, understand that every man around you is your teacher, whether you're learning positives or negatives from them. Right? You don't have to, you know, do something foolish in order to learn that it is foolish and bad. Rather, you can sometimes look at your peers and see the person that is, you know, let's say, get behind the car, the wheel of the car drunk, and then they get into an accident, lose their license, kill somebody, all of these horrible things happen. I don't need to get drunk and get behind the wheel to know that that's stupid and that's wrong. But I can learn from that man and his mistakes simply by beholding the consequences of what they've done. And that's what I mean. And I think that's what my preacher meant at the time. Every man is your preacher, is your teacher. You can learn from everybody. You can learn from every scenario. Now, look what is happening here. Moses here is the one teaching. He's saying, hearken Israel unto the statutes which I teach you. Now understand, this is the word of God here that we're beholding. But this is Moses as he penned it and gave it unto the people. Why should we look to this? Because if you look, you will live, you will possess the land that God is giving you. This is very clear. Hearken Israel what I'm teaching you because if you do these statutes, you will live and you will go in and you will possess what God is giving unto you. And it's so important that he goes on into verse 2, he says, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you. Neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. This is Deuteronomy chapter 4, and verse 2. Ye shall not add to this word. Ye shall not diminish aught from this word as it's being given unto you. You can turn to Proverbs chapter 30. Go to Proverbs chapter 30, but keep your finger in Deuteronomy. And in Proverbs chapter 30, as you go there, I'm going to read for you what it says basically... No, sorry... Go with me to Revelation 22, and I'm going to read from Proverbs chapter 3. Revelation chapter 2, and I'm going to read from Proverbs chapter 30, which says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And this is the, these are kind of the threefold witnesses of that statement of not adding to or not removing from the words of God. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 6, which says, God will reprove thee, and you'll be found a liar if you diminish or remove or add to his words. 
Revelation chapter 22 and in verse 18 makes this a great and serious consequence when the Bible says, Revelation 22 and verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy, of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Now, I believe in the context here, he's referring specifically to the prophetic book of Revelation. But as we see, that same teaching carries through the Bible, grabs you in Proverbs, and then also again back in Deuteronomy chapter 4, and you can go there. His word is sufficient. You got enough of it, you don't need any more. You don't need any less because everything that you need is in there. And that's what God is teaching you here. And that's what Moses is calling to the people's attention. Don't add to, don't diminish on from it. This is sufficient to teach you what you need to do. Verse 3 says, Your eyes, Deuteronomy 4 verse 3, Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you, this day. And that even includes those that, that were ignorant at that time and didn't understand what was going on, the young and the unlearned, perhaps. He says, you've seen what whoredom with and sacrificing to and bowing down unto other gods does to a people. You've learned from that example what happened. God destroyed them from among you, those that did sin in the area of Baal Pure, when they were provoked to get involved in whoredoms and false religion and that type of worship. But also you see by example what happens to those that cleave unto their God. They have blessings abound. They're alive unto this day. And so God here is saying... Grab a hold of these commandments. I'm teaching you. They're important. Listen to what is about to be revealed unto you. That in it you shall live. In it you shall go and possess that land. You shall have the promise of God. Life and death are set before you. Choose you life. You can either look to the example of what the men in the, the situation of Baal Peor did when they went and fornicated and went after other gods and how they were destroyed. Or you can look to the example of those that simply cleave unto the Lord their God. God says, I set before you death and life. Choose you life. What do you got to do? Cleave unto the Lord God. Listen, hearken, absorb the statutes that are being taught, that you may live, is what God here is exhorting, and Moses is exhorting as he brings these examples again unto remembrance. Verse 5, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do so in the land where ye go to possess it. This is Deuteronomy. This is the second iteration of the law. So Moses here speaking, past tense, I have taught you. And again, this is also calling to remembrance the fact that you can go and look to the example because the ones that are standing here today receiving of the second law are there doing so because the whole generation that heard it the first time died off because of unbelief and because of faithlessness, because of not following the words that Moses is about to outline. They turned from the commandment. They turned from the statutes. They did not keep them, and therefore they never got to possess the land. Therefore they are not alive unto this day, Moses is saying. He's like, but I have taught ye should do. This is the bottom line of what he's saying, I believe, in this chapter. I have taught ye should do. Keep these things, and they shall be your wisdom and understanding before the nations you are about to enter into. Look at verse 6. Keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. They were to be in the sight of these nations a wise and understanding people, not in and of themselves, but because they had the statutes and judgments of Almighty God, and because they were special in that case. The nations were to look at the Israelites and say, wow, this is a great nation. Wow, this is an understanding and wise people. They have God so close to them. They hearken unto his words and we can witness what is, is the result of that just by seeing these people. 
And so, in, in a way, you can see the commission here of the Jewish Israelite people at the time. And they had a commission just like us, to go ye into the world and preach the gospel, essentially. Go ye into the world and be a righteous nation in front of the wicked nations of the world, that they would look and say, wow, this is a wise and understanding people. And peradventure, they would then, these nations would want to yoke themselves up with the Israelites because they're successful, because they are blessed, because they are in the will of God in all things, and it's clearly visible. They ought to say, wow, look at these people, when they look at them and see the witness of their works coming off of them. Verse 7, it says, For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God in all things that we call upon Him for? You see how they had power with God to call upon Him for blessings? Who wouldn't want to be a part of a nation that was blessed of God, that they could simply ask rain in new season, and ask for great harvest at the appropriate time, and ask for blessings to, to grow families, and to have, have a great project, uh, pros prosperity and all that. Verse 8 says, And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Now I understand that by and large, most people aren't going to be drawn unto a law that is righteous and just and true and, and perfect, but they might be drawn unto what that what following that law brings into their life. And so that's the double full thing. Some people aren't going to like when you just say, look, here's the steps to success. 1 through 10, these 10 commandments. You want to live and be blessed in this life? Follow the 10 commandments as a nation, okay? People will be like, ah, I'm not really interested. I like what I'm doing right now. But when they see that these 10 commandments lead to blessings and prosperity and rejoicing and, and success and happiness and, and fruitfulness, then they might be like, okay, yeah, give me those 10 steps. It's a small sacrifice, perhaps, to the blessings that are going to be overshadowed upon a people when they do them. And so that was how Israel was to be a witness unto all nations. They were to follow, they were to do as they were taught, and others were to look at them and say, wow, I want what they have. I want the blessing of God in my life. And they would get involved in what Israel was doing. Verse 9, it says, Now only take heed to thyself, and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thine heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. So take heed here, and keep your soul. Be diligent in these things. Have these as, a, as the foundation of your life. Take care to follow through with the duty that's before you. Don't depart from it, but not only don't depart from it, he's saying don't depart, but also teach it. And look, we have the same ministry today. We can take this by type and draw it into our lives. Don't we have the same diligent, the same duty in our lives to hearken unto the Word of God, to do the Word of God, and then to tell others to do the Word of God, to, to teach them? Now, we got to be mindful of this. If, if we're just the guy that's always like, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, but we're not doing the works ourselves, we're just like the Pharisees who come off as hypocrites. So that's why it's kind of the order of things. Hearken, do, then teach. That way your teaching has some weight to it, because when you tell somebody, hey, you know, it's, it's, it's the old adage of our parents with a beer and a smoke saying, kids, you shouldn't drink and smoke. It's bad for your health. I don't ever want to see you drinking and smoking. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't work. But if they're to understand here, right, hearken, smoking's bad, drinking's bad, it'll ruin your life, and then they do it, then when the adult comes to the kid and says, I never want to see you drinking and smoking, it's horrible for you, then there's some weight to it. The kid can say, okay, yeah, you're right, I will try not to, I won't do it, mom and dad, fine. And that's the same thing we have to do. Especially, go to verse 10, it says, especially the day that thou, now he's drawing back to the idea of forgetting what's been taught at this time. Forgetting what you've learned and what you've seen. What are you not to forget? Verse 10, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, gather me the people together and I will make them hear my words that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth and that they may teach their children. Verse 11, and ye came near and stood under the mountain. And the mountain burned with fire unto the midst of heaven, with darkness and clouds and thick darkness. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of words, but saw no similitude, only ye heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, 
which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. So especially then, Israel, remember that day. Remember how God spoke to you at the mountain. Remember the great fire. Remember the voice that you heard. Remember the Ten Commandments. This was Exodus chapter 20. And we're going to hear of it again when we get to Deuteronomy chapter 5. This is an important point, an important milestone in the people of Israel's life. He says, remember that you had heard words and a voice, but there was no similitude. And this is the same relationship we now have with Jesus. Have we not heard of his word? Have we not received and believed his word? Have we not read of him in John chapter 1 as being the word of God? We saw no similitude. So that, that picture of, of you know, white hippie Jesus, that doesn't exist. And this is what God is warning about. He's warning about making a similitude or a figure of something that you have never seen before. Because what that happens when you do that, when you make a likeness of something you've never seen, you're going to get it wrong. And in this case, it leads to idolatry, and it leads to a worship of a false god. And so here, he says in verse 14, And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments, that you might do them in the land where you go to possess it. So they received just statutes and judgments. Um, they were written on a stone. And to us, we can look back to them now as our examples. These stories, these examples, these sermons, these histories, these songs, these poems. We have the whole encompassing of that in scriptures. But at the time, they had that Ten Commandment table to look back to. And above and beyond that, they had what they remembered of the witness of the fire and of the presence of God being there at that time and at that place. And yet he still has to bring to remembrance the warning that, look at verse 15, Take ye heed therefore, take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. Unless thou lift up thine eyes into heaven. And this is the bottom line, most important part of all of it. The figures, I don't only think, is the worst part. It's this in verse 19. Unless thou lift up thine eyes into heaven, when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations that are under heaven. He's saying, he's saying you're going to make images if you forget that they are statutes and judgments that came from the voice of God. You're going to make images if you forget that it's living right and doing right and not some tangible image that you can put up as God that is what's important and right. He's saying you're going to turn from worshiping God and be driven to worship and serve idols if you're not taking heed to this thing, to what I'm trying to explain unto you. Beware of idolatry. You were delivered from it at such a time, the Bible says there, in verse um, 20, it says, But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be a people of inheritance as ye are this day. So why would you go to idolatry when you saw what happened in Egypt and to Egypt? Why would you turn back to that? He pulled you. The Lord pulled you out of that iron furnace. He pulled you out of Egypt, out of the world, to be a people of inheritance. You were delivered from idolatry and the very land of idolatry. By similitude here we have essentially the iron furnace is like a type of hell. I saved you from hell. I pulled you from that. Why would you go back to living as if you were destined to it? Verse 21 says, Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes, and swear that I should not go over Jordan, and that I should not go into the good land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. But I must die in this land. I must not go over Jordan, but ye shall go over and possess that good land. And so this Moses, who in verse 14 was commanded to teach this very covenant, was not the one that was going to reap the rewards of it. They didn't obey, and it was Moses that suffered, unfortunately, at that time. He tried to encourage them and tried to direct them with statutes and judgments unto the way that they ought to live, 
when the people refused. It's such a shame, but it came upon Moses. And I don't believe that was as a result of his teaching ability or his preaching ability, but simply the hearts of men. And we know Moses had something better prepared for him. We've talked about that before. But regardless, you see the power that comes in obedience, that you can affect so many people around you, even the people that are trying to teach you, trying to explain these things to you. Children ought to think about that when they're disobedient unto their parents. It's hurting their parents and potentially hurting their testimony and their rapport with God because they're explaining unto the young ones you ought to live this way when they're disobedient. No matter how you swing it or slice it, it reflects upon the people that gave the teaching. And in Moses' case, not because he didn't teach them correctly, and, and not because he, he was, you know, it says that the Lord was angry with Moses for their sakes. But we know that, that the anger that Moses had caused him to make a poor decision. No, he was told to speak into the rock, and he smite, and he smote it, and then God at that time said, you're not going to enter it. You have, you've, you've succumbed to the same disobedience that the people around you are showing. Nevertheless, verse 23, it continues and says, Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image or likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden, hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. This is a statement that's being made in order to say, Give God your everything. Don't divide up some of his love and some of his obedience and some of his worship that's all deserved unto him and give it to some dumb idol. Don't give it to a part of your life that has nothing to do with the service of him. Rather, we should give all that we can and all that we are unto him. He deserves all of us indeed. He created us. He's raised us up to the point where we are. We got saved because of what he did for us. And the Bible says that God is even jealous over you. In other words, he, he wants all of you. Because he knows that that's what's best for you, not because he's he's some he's some lord over people. But but following God's way, what did it promise at the beginning of this chapter? Is where you get life. Is where you receive all of the promises. Is where you is where you ought to live and be and and behave. Is because that's where you have the best of what God has for you. His perfect will will be realized in your life when you give Him all of yourself. Offer yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. God, which is your reasonable service. Don't be entangled with the yoke of bondage that is this world, that iron furnace, the idolatry, all of those things. They'll lead to suffering and death, but God promises life if you what? If you do what he taught. And so we continue on reading. Verse 25, it says, When thou shalt beget children and children's children, and they have remained long in the land, and shall corrupt yourself. Now this is interesting, because he says, When thou shalt. In other words, in other words, he's promising that this is coming. And I always read this and I'm like, like, man, the Lord already knew our frame. He knew our hearts. He knew that we were going to we were going to turn nations at large. We're going to turn from him and not serve him. And yet he still implores us and, and tries to pull us into serving him. But he says here, when you beget children's children, when you remain long in the land, when you shall corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land which ye go over Jordan to possess it. Ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. If you do evil, you'll be off the land. And here's one of the first of many verses that describe the land promise as conditional. Everyone wants to say that Israel is is. Israel over there, that, that piece of land just belongs to the Jews, right? They confuse that term, Jews, but they'll say, oh, that belongs to Jews, that belongs to Israel, and so and so. Well, the Bible is clear, and this is just one of many places, and Deuteronomy is the best place to find this, where God says, if ye will, then shall I. If ye keep my word, then will I do as I promised. Ye shall receive of the gift of the promised land. This is one of the few times where you find that a gift is actually conditional. And if we think about it long and hard, the gift of eternal life is conditional. It doesn't require any works to receive it, but it does require that you believe and put your faith and ask for it, does it not? So there are conditions to salvation, even as there's conditions to receiving the gift of the promised land unto these people of Israel. It's conditional. I'm going to go again and document all the times that God says that this land is conditional. 
Verse 28 continues on and it says, And there ye shall serve God the work of man's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. He's saying basically that when you go and serve other gods, you're going to reap what you sow. You're going to have gods over you, protecting you, watching you, keeping you. But what are these gods? They're, they're clumps of wood. They're clumps of stone. They can't see. They can't hear. They can't eat. They can't smell. They're nothing. Reap what you sow. Give yourself and your worship to a, a, a stone, and that stone will be there in the day when you need help. You know what it'll do for you? Nothing. But the Lord thy God rather says, hey, I promise that I will be there for you. As I have taught, ye shall do. And if you do, ye shall live. That's a great God. That's a wonderful God. But these reap what they sow. When they will eventually corrupt themselves and turn to follow after a graven image made of stone. Verse 29 reveals the bitter end of all this. It says, But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thine heart. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shalt be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which is swear unto them. And here God extends his mercy beyond what I can even imagine. That a people that would turn so far away from him that they would be serving stones and pieces of wood, would still have the ear of God when he turns, when the man turns from thence, seeks after God, he shall be found. What if he does so with his whole heart, with his whole soul? Then when you're in tribulation, even in the last days, so if you're standing there today and you're far from God and you're not serving God and you don't have his statutes, his frontlets in your eyes and you're not interested in doing the things of God and following after his works as you've been taught you should do, if you're not doing those things, if you're caught up in idolatry by things that you're putting before the Lord, if that's a problem in your life, God here is promising, hey, you want to find me even in these latter days? You want to find me even when you're at your lowest? Turn to the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, with thy whole soul, and you shall find me if you seek me. He says, if you turn, if you come to him, if you, if you repent of that wickedness in your life, believer, God will be there to extend mercy unto you. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which he swear unto them. God will be there ready to bless you and to restore you unto the previous place, unto a place of high regard within his kingdom. He will take you there if you turn to him, if you become obedient unto his things. And step one is turning to God. We can't even of our own selves as believers, if we're backslidden, just suddenly stop doing things that are sinful, and God's just going to bring us in with favor. No, you only have to do just like the prodigal son did. Go back to the Father with all the dung on you, with all the stink from the road, with, with the rags, with the hunger, with, with everything that you're lacking. Go back to the Father in that way and allow Him to accept you. And you know what He'll begin to do? The keeping of the statutes. He'll start to work that into your heart. Turn unto Him. Seek Him with your whole heart, your whole soul. You'll find Him. He'll be waiting there at the farm, looking at the horizon when you come. The second you come to Him, you're going to try to give Him, for, ask for forgiveness, and list all the sins you've committed all these many years you've been straight from Him. But he'll, He won't even hear it. He'll be ready and waiting to just hug on you. Never mind, son. I, I want you back. That's what I wanted. And when He gets you back, you know what He'll do? He'll take those, 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 you know, dung-covered garments off of you and put a robe on you. He'll take where you had nothing and put a, 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 a golden ring upon your finger, new shoes upon your feet. He'll bless you immeasurably. And he'll do so because the Lord thy God is a merciful God. Verse 33. The Lord thy God is a merciful God. He won't forsake you. He won't utterly destroy thee. He won't forget the covenant, the promises that He made unto you, but He will be ready there to pick you up, clean you up, and help you on the path to obedience again after His word. As you have been taught, so shall you do. If you strayed from that, just seek after God and allow His mercy to carry you back to where you were in the beginning. Especially for young children here, especially for the, the, the children in the faith, 
never too late to come back to God, ask for his mercy, and seek after his things. Verse 32 says, For ask now in the days that you are past, which were before thee since the day that God created man upon the earth. So ask this and wonder this. Since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from one side of heaven unto the other, whether there be any such thing as this great thing, or hath been heard of it. What is he talking about here? The, the especially in verse 10. Did ever people hear the voice of God, speaking out of the midst of the fire, as thou hast heard, and, this, and live? Is there ever a people that have heard the voice of God? Even in this room. Isn't it a marvelous thing you've heard the first voice of God? Not thundering from the clouds, but you, you, you've heard it preached unto you. And because it was preached unto you, you received it. You saved it. As from one side of heaven unto the other, has there ever been a thing like that? Where the voice of God comes to a people, and when they heard, they lived? Verse 34, or hath God essayed to go and to take him a nation from the midst of the other of another nation? What an amazing thing this is. By temptations, by signs, by wonders, by war, and by a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord God did for you. In Egypt before your eyes. Has there ever been something like this where God would speak to a man? When that man heard, he lived. And God has said, or was willing to, or decided to take a nation out from amongst people. Isn't it an amazing thing when you think about the fact that we as saved people belong to a nation and where we come from, other nations? God is just plucking people out of the entire earth and adding them to his own nation. One day, he will be Lord over us in this life, on this earth. Did that ever happen? Is that, isn't that a wonderful thing? That God has taken a people and He's used things that are normally not so good in this life. Wonders, war, stretched out arm, great terrors, all the things that God used to bring us to Himself. Think back into your life before you were saved. All the things that you went through for God to bring you unto yourself. Has there ever been something so marvelous and so wonderful as this great thing that God hath done for a people that He loves? Verse 35 says, Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord He is God and there is none else beside Him. Do you know why God showed you all the things that you lived in your life previously being saved? He showed you all of these things, brought you through all of these things to the end that you might know Him. To the end that you might know that the Lord, He is God. There is none else beside Him. Verse 36 says, Out of heaven He made thee to hear His voice, and that He might instruct thee. And upon the earth He showed you His great fire. Thou hast heard His words out of the midst of the fire. What great things God has done and where He revealed Himself by having His voice thunder from heaven. Thundering in our hearts almost was even louder when we were saved. Why? Because He wants to instruct us. He wants us to know Him. He wants us to experience all that He is. Why? Verse 37. And because He loved. Because He loved thy fathers. Therefore he chose their seed after them. He chose you these first so long ago. Because he loved first. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And it's true of the people of the nation of Israel at this time too. Because he loved thy fathers. Therefore he chose their seed after them. And brought thee out in the sight with his mighty power out of Egypt. Verse 39. Verse 38, to drive out nations from before thee, bring your martyr which thou art, bring thee in, to give thee their land for an inheritance as it is this day. Notice it had to go from being their land to being your land. God had to make that land transfer over as a possession. Verse 39, know therefore this day and consider in thine heart. So we were asking about the former days and seeing what great things that God hath done. 
And now we're asked here in verse 39 to know and consider in thine heart. What are we to know? What are we to consider? First and foremost, read here, it says, The Lord, He is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. There is none else. First and foremost, know and consider who He is. Secondly, verse 40, Thou shalt keep therefore His statutes and His commandments, which I command thee this day. What are you to know? What are you to consider? What you should do. Know and consider who He is, now what you should do. Verse 40, it continues, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mightest prolong thy days upon the earth which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. What is Moses here charging the people to do? To know and consider who your Lord is and all that he's done for you. To know and consider what you should do as a result of it, and to know and consider why you should do it. And that's one of these circular patterns. You know God, therefore you do what God wants. Why? Because you know God. Do what He wants. Why? Because you know God. And this is like a cycle of life. Know the Lord. Understand who He is, that He's holy. But not just that He's holy and puts a list of to-dos in front of you. Know that He is holy and of all things, above everything, including the list, He loves you and He has promised to care for you. And His promise and care comes because of the commands that He has given. And they're all just there to help you to know who He is, know what you should do, and to know why you should do it. And then just keep it on. Keep going. Know your God. Love your God. That's what this is here for. That's why Deuteronomy is here. That's why He's giving us Deuteronomy again as teachings that happened in Leviticus and Numbers. Second law is what this has come to is known as Deuteronomy. I have taught ye should do. But it's not just a list of things like a wrathful king would put on a people. He wants you to do them that ye may live. Jesus promises in the New Testament that ye might have life and ye might have it more abundant. Mm -hmm. Abundant life. The good life. The love life. The rich life, right? Not in things of this world, but things so much better. So what God is promising here in a book like Deuteronomy. He is providing in Deuteronomy chapter 4 what I said. I have taught ye should do. Why? Because I love you. And I want what's best for you. Hearken unto these things. Heed these things. For in them ye shall have life. And Jesus says, and life more abundantly. And we all want more abundantly. 